So words can't really describe how inspirational this artist is. Hi guys, this is Chris from DS6 Machina, and I'm talking about the artwork that inspired me as a child, that inspires me today. And let's get right to it because this guy is, the, in my opinion, the greatest living artist. And he's still around, he's still working. I wish I owned more of his work, and I think I'm actually inspired now to go out and, and pursue and grab more of his work. But I'll talk about some of the work. Uh, I have a large collection online. And I've even talked to his estate because I was talk about I was curious about whether or not we could design a uh, a board game around his illustrations. And who is that? It's Chris Foss. Now the funny thing here is that the most seminal book uh, for and Chris Foss's bibliography is 21st Century Foss, which I don't own, but I'd like to. And obviously, I don't own Joy of Sex, which he also illustrated. I do own Iswan, Tire of a Space Person. And I also have this, the portfolio. Now, in my previous video, I showed uh, the Jim Burns one. This did not show up in this way, obviously. It comes into a paper tiger book, and the pages fall out very, very quickly. And we can see the edges have been popped off when it simply fell. It fell right away. It wasn't like weeks later. It's like the moment I opened it, pages were falling out. And to say that Chris Foss is inspirational is pretty mildly. I have been using his illustrations in my work as, insp as, as inspiration for my work um, for years, uh, since probably the early 90s, late 80s. Uh, I have a, a sci-fi setting called Pathfinder, which I created in the 1990s. And everything Chris Foss, I, I you know, I, you know I, I couldn't show the artwork, obviously. But I would just say, you know, there's a ship called a crab, and I would just describe it. And in fact, in my in my Pathfinder uh, campaign I ran in the mid '90s, the main characters flew in this very ship. Like I said, it was just a group of five people, and I showed them this, and like, this is your ship, and that became the ship. And this checker colored style moves me to this day. Uh, even so, in my own, whenever I paint minis. And if I, ever, if I ever paint a spaceship, I'm ignoring any assumed paint scheme. Paint scheme. I'm just going to paint like this. I am nowhere close to the style of him, but let me, let me give you an example. So this is my uh, Tau from uh, Warhammer 40K, and this is directly inspired by this illustration. So I designed these guys. I think one of my other ones actually has a checkerboard on it. Uh, this one doesn't, but I have some mechs to do it as well. And I absolutely love this, this style, and I wish... I wish spaceships were designed more this way. I know that um, Chris Foss got work even recently. He designed uh, the main ship from Guardians of the Galaxy. But the uh, it's it's interesting that my love of colorful space is only being kept alive by the Marvel movies, of all things. It's a Triangular Spaceship from 1974, which does not in any way look like a Star Destroyer. As you might imagine, that would have been made first before then. This is another ship uh, that I... Pulled into my Pathfinder. I love this look. I love this design. The purple, the nose. Like he's a great. It's a great melding of 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 rounded edges and straight lines. This is um, traveling cities. These are run rails from 1981. I created a, a planet called Stasco, which had exactly that. In fact, I think the the moving domes on. Uh, in my current affinity setting, there are domes on, that move around a giant spaceship. I think they're di directly inspired by this idea of huge city blocks moving on rails. And the whole idea, of course, <clears throat> is that, in my idea, that they would move to either stay away from the sun, stay in some kind of mid-zone, or uh, follow the sun in order to keep solar energy going. And obviously within this idea that this was their solution to the whole thing. But it's fanciful. That uh, whole point. I love the dots he gives a scale. He doesn't make small ships. He makes colossal constructs. Miles high. You can, and I love the idea of these dots being these lights. And you can use that as scale. Here's another thing. He also loves his robots. We'll get into that too. But... Um, you know, you didn't need to give stripes on this pyramid. It could have just been gray, but I love the fact that it's got stripes. He loves his orange. Like he said, no, he's not a Gundam designer. I love the rounded nature. I love the idea that also that his robots, whenever they're presented, they're like, they're forgotten machines, that they've been left to their own devices and they're just kind of 
doing their programming. Sometimes it's violent, sometimes it's not. I know what this is, this is Rail Runner. Another, uh, I actually pulled the term Rail Runner, it's actually mentioned in Taurus, my current, 1969, Jesus. I love that. Of course, there's a logic to this, is that, is this a cable or is this a flat pipe? The idea of it being rail, it'd be a flat pipe, but it seems to be going through the ship. So it makes me wonder how it makes this turn because this ship seems too long to do that. So this has always been confusing unless it's on the opposite side or what have you. But once again, this is a huge ship moving this floating rail and just what ideas that can come. Of course, you have to have a city on an asteroid. I imagine this is a mining city or a floating colony. Very cool design. Because why not? Why not have a super tanker where the mass majority of its mass is underwater? See? It's hull and payload below the surface. I rem remember the details. It's 1970. But rounded edges. Also very large. The little conning towers there, which is very cool. Fleeing Snowcat. What a cool design. We don't know what this is. You have to assume this is over the horizon. It must be miles long. And you can see by the lights that it's miles long. Don't know what kind of story it is. And uh, here's another ship that I ripped off for Pathfinder. But uh, very cool. Big, huge solar or reflector arrays. You know, and what's this one called? This was called Voyage to the Forbidden Planet from 1989. He likes his space battles. And that's... Like I said, we, we need more colorful spaceships. Like this one, rounded, ship in the back, very angular, beautiful blue, green. But I also want to take a focus, because we, we, we see it in a little bit, but this one is another thing I like about 1970s art, which we don't see nowadays, is the background. Like the idea, yeah, a lot of times background is going to be black, but a lot of images that we've seen even so far, uh, especially with this one, we can see the fact that we have a bright sun that's casting all this light. We see the gas coming up and then we create a backdrop that's not black. And it's very cool. And we see a lot of why a lot of his illustrations, they have planets or they're on a planet. And that gives us dimension. If it's just black space, it's not very interesting. And I think a lot of people kind of forget that. Once again, like, you know, you have to assume what this scale is, but we have Venice, LA Towers. I'm not sure what that means. Um, once again, really fascinating. And we have that checkered design, which it cannot have been hard. It would have been easier and lazier just to have solid colors, and I don't think people would question. But that exquisite detail, that dots, the hatches, the misplaced, I want to say mis but mismatched plates so from repairing, from m modifications, right? Little extra bits and pieces, knoblies, which I think is actually a term he uses. All right, and this one is uh, the Euphonauts, 1970. Like, once again, look, look at the detail on that thing. Like, we're having trouble determining scale. We have to assume with this tree that, um, and with the building in the background, that people are relatively big, and we can see hatches here. We assume so we're looking at a slightly smaller scale, but we have still the bolts and rivets and dots scattering the whole thing. And we don't know what it's doing, but there it is. Here's another perfect example of what I mean. Look at that. Beautiful, giant spaceship. Dozens and dozens of little lights, big engines. We see a, co a colony on a planet that's got a that sun so uh, so close that it's scorching the surface. Like there's so much to um, to decompile from that image. Napoleon submarine. Very cool. Here's a dry riverbed. Watery Stranded Peru, a true incident. I actually would wouldn't mind saying that then. Very cool. Firelands, whatever. That's a cover from a book, beautiful illustration. This is a cool one. Once again, we look at this very large ship. It scales a bit off, so we can kind of assume that these are windows, so it's not a massive vessel. It's not kilometers long, but there's a lot of excess detail. Numbers, and once again, little splotches with color and blue. And we see in the background, this is the part that's a little confusing, because we see this assembly here, and it looks like it's in, it's behind 
this distant colony. So I actually think that this might be an error. I don't know if, if Chris would ever, would ever watch this video, he can answer whether or not this is a mistake, because this looks like these lights are part of this construct, which is part of this construct, but then we have this, which is a very distant colony. It's always confused me, but I still love, once again, the dimension of the scene. Um, I love the clouds, both passing in front and behind, this cloudy back backdrop. So space is, it's never black. It's a little black on the top, but the vast majority of it is cloudy, and it, it's, it's so, so fascinating. I don't even know what the heck this is. Fireball. I assume it's, so once again, it's a robot, but we don't know the story. We know it's an apocalyptic Earth and so forth. This is another idea of, of, of predatory robots feasting on other predatory robots. This is another idea that I pulled into Taurus. All the animals are basically robots, and I love this idea. Do you think uh, Horizon Zero Dawn is original? Chris Falls got you beat by about 40 years. Don't know the story being told here. We see what looks to be an alien, a demonic creature. He's got some kind of laser weapon. He's firing at this poor person. And we have a floating ship in the background. Croc, flying man. Here we see a ship that's, it's crashed into this organic assembly. We can see the windows give us scale. You see it's probably been there for some time. And it's, once again, he's fantastic at these uh, space wrecks. And then we have... Once again, the idea of monsters attacking. This is obviously some kind of tram. And um, the yellows and reds, beautiful blue sky, and weird snake-like creatures. And another fantastic ship design. Unlike those other designs, very curved, very, very rounded. Big air intakes, or atmosphere intakes. And very tricky to kind of understand the scale. You have to assume that it's could be miles long because we can see little tiny dots so small that this thing is hundreds of meters tall potentially thousands of meters long and once again we don't have a space background this thing's moving through the atmosphere of a planet so that's so much more fascinating even as a little ship in the background but that's so much more interesting and so that's the reason why you imagine why as a person who's a sci-fi fan like i am why i would be inspired but uh, let's go into the other book now, Diary Space Person was an expensive book when I got it. It's it looks it says oh look at that price ten to ninety five pounds. No, this thing cost me seventy bucks to get it here. This was not a cheap book, and I don't think it's actually gone up in value. Not really. I could probably get one now for about the same price as when I paid for this one. Um, but this was interesting because this was one of the few occasions where uh, Chris actually created his own lore, and what he did, he basically took all of his illustrations. And, and compiled them into a story. And so what he did is that he combined uh, his sci-fi cover art, some other illustrations, and he combined that with some original illustrations plus the illustrations from uh, The Joy of Sex. So once again, this is kind of a subject warning for people who may be uh, triggered by anything like that. But um, this is explained, and I, I, can, I, can, I, I haven't read this in probably 20 years, that this diary was found... And um, oh, this actually says right here, I'll just read it up. This book has a facsimile of parts of a diary uh, discovered during the excavation of the New York Venice site, New Venice site. It charts the extraordinary adventures of a typical student who refers to herself simply as Jay. In her own imitable language, she describes and illustrates her sensual and spiritual odyssey through time and space as she is buffeted by circumstances and chance encounters. The dates bear no relation to known calendars or chronologies, and carbon dating has so far been unsuccessful in identifying the age of the material. So the idea is that hundreds or even thousands of years in the future, this book is discovered and it's already talking about events that happened centuries in our future. Because this is a future with space travel, pirates, aliens. Um, and it should be noted, this is also, once again, wonderful little entries here. And we and there is a story being told, but it's being told uh, very non-traditionally. By the way, the this Alpha Den, Beta Den, Gamma Den, which we'll see throughout this whole book, I rip that off to this day. In my writing, I will always put a, in a lot of my writing, I have often put in little, I won't say I'm ripping off, I'll say I'm paying tribute. But most of the time, it's me playing off of paying tribute by throwing a little Easter eggs. And no one's ever caught it and say that you, you, you see, it's like, I'll say like the serial number of a ship is Alpha Den 246 or something like that. I never refer to it as, an, as a date. 
but it's like uh, you know we're going into this vault and we're finding which one we're finding volume gamma den 246 beta or whatever and every time you see the word alpha den or beta den it's directly it's a paying tribute to this book which was so inspiring in my youth and once again, uh, and we have this story. Sometimes they're self-portraits, as and she obviously, whenever you see sketches, uh, it's it's assumed that she's drawing them. And then we have images. Obviously, we see the Venice, and he tells his story, employing this artwork, and tells her t tells us of these adventures that she went on from through time and space, uh, getting impregnated by a weird fungal animal at one point, and that's absolutely true. And um, at one point, rather inappropriately, getting sold to uh, slavers. There's that ship, and she talks about her story and her character she meets. Like this is, yeah, this is actually the point where the the slavers, where they're showing, where they're trying to sell off their product. Um, we're seeing a lot of these designs as before. Um, yeah, some of these are somewhat probably unique to the setting, and some of them are probably taken from a Joy of Sex, but. Uh, like that one, I love that one. That's a great image. I love this. That, that's an image I, I absolutely love to death. Uh, that's a swamper. It's not called a swamper in the book. That's what I call a swamper. It's a, it's a big six-wheeled vehicle. Oh, when I ran my Pathfinder game, the characters had that as well. I love that design, this floating three-barrel vehicle that's going through this minefield. I don't know, maybe he did call it a Swamper. I don't think... Yeah, he did call it a Swamper. I just ripped off the name as well. <laughs> I'll give credit. This one I've loved for decades. I love this image. Just giant freaking robot. We don't know what it's doing there. Once again, we look at a design that doesn't have to be this detailed, but it is. We have beautiful cityscape, dark background, lights across the whole hull. With the penis building. A lot of uh, episodes with pirates. Yeah, in many ways, I don't know whether or not this kind of book would fly nowadays. Like I said, it's a product of its time period. Like I said, even directly, like the, the, the insinuation of this illustration just says so much. Oh yeah, the ambush. There's a big, big battle scene here, going through space warps, and oh, there's another great, like, perfectly blue background. And uh, yeah, this was—I don't know if he's ever done it again or before. And I don't know whether or not he he, he wrote everything, but it's incredibly creative. Just the whole story, just visual styles, creative. It's. A universe entirely on its own, built from his designs. Every illustration, every illustration is explained, is referenced. And uh, and there's that same illustration with the dick building. <laughs> oh, this one, I love this. Like, this is a whole story of her traveling through this weird landscape and then literally coming face to face with the brain and then she sees the construct for the first time as she escapes it. Uh, a fantastic uh, design. Great, great uh, creative storytelling. And then finally, uh, near the end of the story, she finally makes it back to Earth, and she finds it completely abandoned with just robots. And it seems to be an apocalyptic wasteland. The idea that nobody goes to Earth in this setting because it's basically a shithole. She finally makes it back to Earth, finds it basically uninhabitable, and uh, and it goes on from there. But it's 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 a very fascinating story. This book, like everything else Paper Tiger makes, was falling apart. In fact, uh, it came apart so badly, I went in and, and poured crazy glue inside the spine to keep it together. And that's why I'm very careful with this book. Because it's uh, the fact that you know, if, there's, if there's copies that are still in, in, in good condition, that'd be a real shock. But that gives you an idea of how much Chris Foss's illustrations shaped my literary past when I was writing... Uh, role-playing games in the early 90s when I was a teenager, I pulled images from Chris Foss and I explained things. And, and my, my Pathfinder setting was, it's like 80% Chris Foss. Uh, that's all, it's all homebrew. It's never been used. It's just entirely for our own entertainment purposes. Uh, I would love, it'd be my dream to work with Chris Foss. He's still around today, still doing our work. And uh, my idea was to have some type of space-based game 
where characters are trying to salvage space wrecks. And it's inspired by the artwork of Chris Foss. I just, I haven't been in a situation or in a, in a place financially where I could develop it, but it would be a, it would be a dream to get do that while we, while while uh, Chris is still with us. But yeah, the number one inspirational artist from my youth, and that's Chris Foss. Love the man dearly. Uh, he has a YouTube page, so if you have a chance, um, check it out. The, he posts still pretty regularly. I think it's his daughter that um, collates and posts the videos. But you hear him a lot and. To hear him explain things and hear his imagination go wild, is, is, it's intoxicating. Uh, so absolutely, incredibly inspirational. And I think this is inspiring me to collect his other work. Um, I know there's a book called Hardware. And I, it's on my wish list for some time, but I actually want to pony up the money and get one of the custom ones that he has actually drawn inside. And that would probably be the, uh, I want to say a bucket list item to own that. Just to have that in my possession would just be a, a real dream. But yeah, Chris Foss, there you go. Anyway, guys, like and subscribe, and I will talk to you guys later.